Let's pray. God, right now I'm praying for myself. Help me to hear this message as well as what I'm delivering to the people. Let not my heart be stone, but beating fervently for you. Calm, calm me so I can hear you. Quiet, anything which will speak louder than you. Silence it. I pray that not for me only, but for every person here. In Christ's name, amen. In our passage this morning, we have actually two groups of people. And they start questioning what Jesus says and what he does. What did he do? He didn't wash his hands. Oh my! We'll talk more about that. But who did they think they were? Who were these Pharisees and teachers of the law or scribes? I think on your translation. Well, throughout Christ's ministry, these Jewish leaders continually sought to confront Jesus. They did so by trying to set up some roadblocks of reason in confronting our Lord, trying to trip him up. After all, who are we supposed to pay taxes to? Are we supposed to pay taxes to Rome? Or another group said, according to the Levirate law, that if a man is married and he dies, therefore his wife is supposed to marry his brother so that they can have offspring in the older brother's name. But if this happens seven times, when they all die, whose wife will she be? Trying to trip Jesus up. Now, when Jesus returned in response, he wouldn't just come off in an argumental way. For the most part, he always spoke more of love and justice. But again, who are these people? We talk about them. We badmouth them a lot in church. As Christians, we're supposed to love everyone, but we badmouth the Pharisees a lot. Um, but who were they? Well, simplistically, they could be described as the religious purists who were very carefully observed every aspect of the Jewish law. If the law said, we need to have a fast, you can be sure that the Pharisees were there before it even began, and they were the last ones to leave. And if they, the law called for a tithe, they gave a tithe and an offering. Sounds like good Christian folk. We give it all. But then they added this other aspect. They made sure everyone knew that they gave their all. Look at us. They portrayed themselves as better than everyone else. And their very name suggests the idea. Pharisee means one who has separated themselves. They refused to associate with the sinners that were around them. And they took great lengths to ensure that they remained set apart. The Talmud, which is a... Old Testament commentary done by Jewish leaders stated that the Talmud was written after the time of Christ. But in referring to their own people, they said there are at least seven types of Pharisees that could be found. And these are all, or not, a wonderful job, wonderful job. Now the first type of which they said is the Shikmi, or also known as the shoulder Pharisee. These men would wear good deeds on their shoulders so that everyone could see what good deeds they did. Just think of a religious boy scout. Look at all my merit badges. <laughs> Next one, the Nikpi, or Wade of Lubin, 
Also, the Pharisee that knocks his feet together. Why? These men would always find excuses for putting off a good deed. Well, maybe if I wait a while, someone else will do it. <laughs> I like this next one. The Kazai. Or the bruised or bleeding Pharisee. These men did not want to be distracted from their pursuit of God by the sin that lived amongst us. So they wore blinders. And because they were blinders, they often ran into walls. That's why they are the bruised or the bleeding Pharisees. <laughs> then there's the pestle. These men would continually walk around in a bowly presence all the time. And somehow that looks like a pestle in a mortar. I don't see the resemblance. But because it was a fake humility. Then there's the ever reckoning. These men continually weighed good deeds versus bad ones. The question in their mind was, what further duty is there for me that I may perform it? Not of good, but I want to make sure my good outweighs the bad. What other good thing can I do, or what bad thing can I avoid? So at least my scale is rightly proportioned. Then you have the fearful, those who did good deeds simply because they feared punishment. And then the love Pharisees, which I hope all of us are, those who serve God out of love. But the Pharisees are not the only group here. Depending upon your translation, teachers of the law, scribes, they spend a lot of time, these two groups spend a lot of time together. The scribes were the lawyers of the legal count and legal counselors to the Pharisees. The Pharisees lived out while the scribes translated, interpreted, gave new meaning. They were the experts on what the Bible said. They determined how a law ought to be observed and how it might also be avoided. They are the ones who invented escape clauses to the Bible. For example, the law says for six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest. Holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day is to be put to death. Simply put, don't work on the Sabbath. Okay. But the question is, what is work? What, what can I do? What can't I do? Is lying in my hammock work? Well, they came up with this uh, way of putting the idea. To carry a burden is forbidden on the Sabbath. He who carries anything, whether it be in his right hand or his left hand, or in his bosom or his shoulder, is guilty. Okay, but, comes an interesting by here. He who carries anything on the back of his hand, or with his foot, or with his mouth, or with his elbow, or with his ear, I still, how do you carry things with your ear? Outside of an earring, uh, or with his hair, which I can't do, or with his money bag turned upside down, or between his money bag and his shirt, or in the fold of his shirt, or in his shoe, or in his sandal, it's not guilty. Because he did not carry it in the usual way, so therefore it's not work. So if I'm supposed to carry this rock, as a Sabbath, okay, I'll have to hop around like this. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to damage the floors and get in trouble with trustees. Try <laughs> uh, But also, if I want to just even take a stroll, better not carry my wallet because there's something in it. I can't carry the, those IDs and money in the same way. I would have to take all the cards out and then maybe put it in my shoe or something. They're making work out not working. But in order so that they could be right. They did that so that they could try to make sure that they were the ones who avoided breaking the law. They would condemn anyone who would do it not their way. And this was all done in the name of religion. 
But then one of them has this wonderful idea, let's invite this new rabbi and have him for dinner. Jesus. Jesus comes and has dinner with him. But he neglects to wash his hands. <coughs> if Mary was there, she would have been ashamed of her boy not washing his hands before dinner. No, this is not the type of washing hands. I do not doubt my Lord and Savior knew mm -hmm. what meant to have clean hands before eating. This is a ceremonial cleansing which the Jews, especially the religious leaders, adopted. It wasn't to cleanse the dirt. It was just to say that you are right with the Lord. And you did so after every course. Okay, we, we can go out to eat, say, to um, Olive Garden. They bring the, the breadsticks out. Well, we wash our hands. We have our breadsticks. Oh, they're getting ready to bring out the appetizer. Excuse us, we have to go wash our hands. Come back and enjoy your calamari or whatever you're having. Oh, now they're bringing out the main course. No, the salad. Or super salad. Oh, gotta wash our hands first. They were continually doing this for no purpose except to look like they were righteous. Jesus had no part of it because it's for naught. He just did not observe. When they confronted Jesus, why he did not do this? Jesus is one of those moments when he did not act like Jesus, the one we know and love. We always think of, have the little children come unto me. The, the meek and mild Jesus. There are times when Jesus let his temper fly. Remember the uh, temple experiment? Turning over tables? Driving people out of the temple with the whip? That's our still our Savior Jesus. Jesus is now doing it with the Pharisees with a literal tongue lashing, if you will. He goes off on them. And he gives a three prong attack. He says, first of all, woe to you Pharisees. You give 10% of everything. We barley, mint, everything. But you fail to love God and you fail to treat people with justice. Shame on you, or as many translations, woe is you. Then he goes on and goes, woe to you Pharisees. You always take the absolute best seats in the synagogue. In the very front row. We know they weren't Baptists because of that statement. Mm -hmm. Everyone takes the back row of the Baptist church. Mm -hmm. But they want the best seats so that they can be seen. Not so that they can hear and understand everything that the teacher is teaching. No, they want to be seen by everyone else. Shame on you. Then he, once more, you tell people that if you touch a gravestone, even by accident, they will be unclean. But you are walking gravestones. All that is within you is dead. And you are therefore trying to teach death to those under you. Woe to you. Shame on you. Well, the scribes don't like that as their friends, the Pharisees, are getting beat up. So one of them steps up and says, You're hurting our feelings. Woo hoo hoo. Quit that, Jesus. Jesus doesn't stop. He says, okay, I'll quit tacking your friends. I'm after you now. <laughs> Woe to you, scribes. You make rules for others to follow, and then you invent ways so you can escape. <clears throat> Woe to you, scribes, because the only prophets you like are dead prophets. When a live prophet is here, you say they are not of God. But you honor the dead ones. The dead ones which your forefathers killed. Woe to 
you. Woe to you, scribes! You made God's book, God's holy word, a book of riddles that only confuse and confound the people instead of teaching them and enlightening them. Shame on you as well. The common thread in all these woes, whether it be the Pharisees or to the scribes, is that these groups wanted to keep their hands, their hands alone, on their religious entrance into heaven. If you don't do it like we do, you're wrong, and therefore heaven is not yours. You are not receiving all the promises of God because you are not like us. We're in the right, you're in the wrong. They wanted to know, to determine what the rules should be. They wanted to decide who would meet, who would meet the rules and who would break them. They wanted to preserve, watch what I'm saying here, but it's preserve the church the way it was for them. The way they liked it. When they were on top. They like using their own lives as the yardstick to measure everyone else's righteousness. Instead of letting God speak, let God's rules of righteousness be. They said, no, ours is better. And if you don't buy it, you are getting the stick. If there is one thing comforting in this story, he did not denounce, Jesus did not denounce the scribes and Pharisees as a religious people per se. Instead, he was condemning their religious piety. How holy we think we are when we're really a bunch of sinners just saved by grace. He denounced their legalism. As Delan made a very valid point this morning, it's not how well you keep the Ten Commandments or the two great commandments. It's how well you know and love your God. If you're knowing and loving your God, you will emphatically, out of love, obey the Ten and the Two. But if you're simply obeying, And not loving. And don't tell me you don't know what that means. As a kid, when mom told you to go apologize to your brother or sister, and you didn't really want to, but knew if you knew if you didn't, you'd be in worse trouble. What'd you do? You obeyed. Maybe not in spirit. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's how we act sometimes. We don't be, be caught in bigger trouble with the Father, so we'll go through the actions looking like we're righteous, that we are the, the better person. But in doing so, we develop our own personal pride. And Jesus does attack that, especially when it is a religious pride. It is a relationship which we have not a religious experience. We want a relationship, not to know that we're just going through the legalities. But what does that mean for us today? Well, the application is subtle, maybe, maybe not, but it's potentially painful. The application is, if we met a Pharisee on the streets today, he would, she would probably look a lot like us. It is not us who determine what the religious rules ought to be. It is God and God alone. He is the ultimate judge. He is the lawmaker. He is the enforcer. He is also the person who grants the pardon. Not us. Him alone. 
It is not our individual Christian experience how the yardstick by which we measure other Christian people is by God's standard. And then we don't even judge. We just come alongside and say, look, I know what you're going through. I'm there myself. Instead of using this yardstick to judge him, we're going to use this yardstick to prop each other up and lean on each other's shoulders and walk together. <clears throat> Instead, we use it to measure others and beat them down. Call, Christ called us to lift us up. Pharisees do exist. They exist in all denominations. Yes, there are the Methodist Pharisees, the Lutheran Pharisees, the Catholic Pharisees, non-denominational Pharisees, and dare I say, yes, there's Baptist Pharisees. And even American Baptist Pharisees. This isn't just the Southern Baptists or the Conservative Baptists. The American Baptists. It happens whenever people are convinced that their way is the right way. And therefore dismiss others as wrong. Nope, you're wrong. We're not talking about difference of doctrine. Because we need doctrine. And we're not talking about structure. Because every church needs structure. I'm talking about tolerance of disagreement. How do we care for people who do not readily fit into our congregational structure? Simple questions. Do we love them? Do we ignore them? Do we hate them? Do we dismiss or coexist with them? How are we treating one another? Jesus proved rather emphatically on the cross that love is most important. And I'm not talking man-made love, but God love. Love as Christ loved, because Christ loves you. Jesus proclaimed that people are more important than any program, any piece of structure. It's the people that matter. Jesus didn't die for Awana. I love Awana, but Jesus didn't die for Awana. Jesus died for the kids in Awana. He died for you. Because as you're teaching those kids, Jesus is also talking to you. Compassion is more important than protocol. That's not we say we throw out the rules. We need the truth. But we know we need to know how to properly use the truth. It's there to lead us, to guide us, not to beat each other up with. The Pharisee nature that is deep within us disagrees with our Lord. Jesus called us to embrace the very people that Jesus himself embraced. Yes, he went ballistic on those Pharisees and the scribes, but he loved them. But he was the only one who had the authority to say, you got it wrong. His spirit still speaks to that today to do. But we must listen to the spirit. Help one another. Say, let's look at this truth together. See how both of us can learn from it and be challenged by it. We are called, like I said, to embrace. But instead, we choose to fiddle with the fine prints of what Jesus says and take our focus away from the mission and place it upon petty details. A modern day example, and I, I will be changing it up a little bit, and you will see why. A sociologist and yes, American Baptist minister, Tony Campolo, once described the greatest criticism he ever received while speaking in a church. Standing piously, no, before this piously dressed, religious sounding congregation, Campolo made the following announcement. <coughs> Tonight in West Africa, 6,000 people will die of starvation, and you don't give a cow patty. He didn't use the word cow patty.
The people would gasp. Tony didn't let up. And right now you are more concerned about me using the word cow patty than about 6,000 people dying in Africa. Tony's audience missed the point. Those who were listening to Jesus at that meal missed the point as well. They resented being scolded by Jesus. Their hearts were hardened and responded with criticism and rejection. Because there was something else that happened after what Natalie read for us. In verses 53 and 54, after this meal, Jesus went outside, the scriptures tell us, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. They weren't listening. Their hearts were stoned. They were ready to stone him if they could. They were not being receptive. Our heart maybe has turned to stone itself. But once it's, something is turned hard, it is hard to turn soft. Not impossible, but very hard. What can turn something hard to soft? Usually two things. Extreme pressure and extreme heat. And how many of you want to go through extreme heat and extreme pressure in your life? I don't. And so instead of continually being a hard heart to what Jesus is saying and I'm doing something else, Lord, make me soft. Make me powerful to you, liable to you. And that begins with humility. We don't know what is right. We only have the Spirit and His Word to help us. We need to confess that we are not God. Build up, making that flesh and blood turn stone cold and hard. If Christ is all about love, <clears throat> love and truth, how can you love a stone? You can't. You can only love a person, and you can only receive love as a person. I can really, I'm not going to. Kiss this rock. Oh, how much I love you, love you, love you. I'd come away with dusty lips, first of all. But would it feel my affection? No. God is saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. I died for you. But we're going, hmm, so what? Is that how you respect and love your Lord and Savior? I hope not. I hope you cast that calcium buildup that might be on your heart right now Lay it at the foot of the cross. The decision is yours. He is the only one who can really make you know and experience true life. I want to see a church on fire with the Spirit who knows who God is and listens to Him. Active and mobile. Instead of a church full of very stylized marble statues. Ah. Those statues are nothing. They do nothing. And in time they will crumble. But the soul of a person beating for God lives forever. Mm -hmm. Let that heart of stone be tossed from you. Fall or far away. Let's pray. Lord, we just want to come before you. We see how the Pharisees and the scribes did everything to make sure that 
at least in their own minds, that they were at the very center of it. That they knew better than anyone else, and they took pride in that. And now, dear Lord, say, I know I can be a Pharisee at times, too. I can be a scribe and try to make things so that at least I look good. I'm wrong. Calcium has developed within my heart. Because calcium is there, I cannot hear your voice. We want to hear your voice, each and every one of us. Help us to say, search me and try me, O Lord. See if there's anything against you. And turn it over to you. And leave it there at the We want to be alive, not statues whose only destiny is to crumble. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Jesus came and lived among us and died. He died so for you because he loved you. He says, all you have to do is believe in me, and there is so much available for you, blessing upon blessing, and eternity in heaven, and knowing what love and life is. If you want to know him, all you have to do is pray a prayer. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Please forgive me my sins. And guess what? He will come. Amen. He's already standing at that door of your heart, knocking in. Say, I want to come in. Let him in. And be changed by the presence of the Son of God. Amen. Can we have our song? If you want to know about Jesus, I'm here. If you want someone to pray with, I'm here. But I'm not Jesus. Amen.